literally just do it. The timing will never be right. I launched a franchise system, had our second child at the same exact time with an offer of half a million plus to continue doing the stuff that I've been doing. It was not a good time, but no time is a, no time yeah. is a good time to start a business. So if you're waiting for that perfect time, you will be waiting forever. Yo, 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 this is the Streetwise Podcast. We're here to help you level up your game, level up your leadership, and level up your life. I'm your host, Matthew McReynolds. I'm a multi-brand franchisee, and I'm a franchise consultant, where I help people find, launch, and build their ideal business. My main goal is to help you get off of zero and become the person that your dreams need you to be. Buckle up, get your popcorn ready, let's go. All right, Streetwise Nation, we've got Aaron Harper with Rolling Studs here to talk to us and just fill us with a whole bunch of knowledge and some wisdom. Mr. Aaron, man, appreciate you for hopping on. How you doing today? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm awesome. It's a great day and I'm excited to talk with you. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Man, likewise. And this is actually another level point for me. This is really cool because I've heard you on multiple podcasts in the past and I've followed your story. So for you to be on mine is it's just really exciting for me. So I, I hope to do it, hope to do it justice. But <laughs> all right. So tell me a little bit about your, what's your role and how does that translate into your day to day? Yeah, sure. So I'm the CEO and co-founder of Rolling Suds, a franchise system that was built around a 34 year old uh, pressure washing business, family business. So I've been in the franchise industry for years. So I actually don't have any background in power washing other than a Sunday where my wife was like, you need to power wash the house. And I just (laughs) burned an entire Sunday buying a $300 machine and just like burned a Sunday that I'll never get back. And um, so that was like my experience prior to this. So my experience is actually in the franchise industry, scaling franchise systems. Um, Interesting. And so, yeah, so carpet cleaning, was working at a carpet cleaning franchise. That was the first job I had. Then we got into a drywall repair franchise. That was in 2020. So in the middle of COVID, helped turn that business around from like no systems to systems, emerging brand. And then I put systems in place and we grew that brand by 223 locations in two years. They opened with jobs and estimates on the calendar and they opened with like labor hired prior to going to training. So some good systems that we had in place. Then I was like, yeah, the company that I worked for was like, we want you to do it again. We're going to buy this business. It's not a franchise yet. We want you to franchise it and we'll double your salary and give you a really fancy title. And I was like, wait a minute, I can do this on my own. (laughs) I can build a team. I can find a business that I believe in. I can franchise that business and make it become the biggest brand in the world in whichever industry I decide. So looked at about two dozen businesses ranging from 750,000 in top line revenue to 14 million, all in the residential and commercial services space that were not franchised yet that I could turn into a franchise. Met the founders of Rolling Suds in September of 2022. Best business I looked at. Acquired the franchise rights, raised capital from, you know, some real industry legends really in the franchise industry raised a significant amount of capital so I could do it the right way. And then started franchising and acquired the rights in January of 23, started franchising end of February of 23. We've turned away 51 people who weren't right for our system, which is about one person per week. They had the capital, they weren't right. We've signed up 40 franchisees who have purchased 128 territories in 24 states. And we've done that in 11 months. And so I have a team of 17 people that work for me. I have three direct reports, everyone else reports to them. And then in response to your question about day-to-day, my day-to-day is hand selecting the franchisees myself right now, making sure the right people come in with the right expectations and then letting the people that I hired to do the right, to do this, to support franchisees, letting them do what they're best at. And I focus on doing stuff like this and making sure that the brand is represented well on the front end. That's really cool, man. Okay, so something that I wanna hit on that you talked about, and I I see you talking about this quite a bit. So I've been excited for this one. When you talk about turning people away, so you're telling me that just because somebody's got money, they're not, they might not be right for a system. I don't think all franchise franchisors do that. 
but who am I to say, what does that process look like for <laughs> you whenever you're building out the culture of your entire system? I mean, that's a big responsibility and it, it seems like you're taking it, you're taking it to the chest. So tell me about that a little bit. What do you mean they weren't right so I, for, for you guys? So I take, yeah. Yeah, no. So I take it really seriously. I believe that the culture of franchisees, and you could probably speak to this, that you have with the other franchisees, if it's the right culture, can be more valuable than the actual support that the franchisor provides. 100%. But if you have a bunch of franchisees who have different goals, and they're all like, one wants to like, be a one truck operator and like be him like can do this with his son and like never scale. And then you have other ones that like want to grow to 27 trucks. Like the culture can't be as tight knit versus if everyone wants to grow to 27 trucks. And so my thought was before I started franchising this business, I was like, all right, well, who's going to be successful in my system, both from a culture standpoint and also like their goals. And so sat down, really analyzed that. And then basically I realized I'm like, okay, well, we're only looking for people who want to build big businesses. Like that's it. Okay. If someone wants one to two to three trucks, like that's not our buyer. We're not looking for the guy who wants to replace his salary year one. Like that's not our buyer. We are not looking for what we're looking for is people who want to provide exceptional experiences to their customers and be part of their community, but they're always going to move the goalpost. Like if they get to a million dollars, it's how do we get to $3 million? If they get to $3 million, they're going to say, how do I get to 10 million? They get to 10 million. How do I acquire other locations? How do I acquire other brands? How do I build? Like those are our buyers. And so anyone who's not that is immediately disqualified. Interesting. Regardless so do you have of a, the capital you have a, they have. Do you have a process that you take these? I'm sure you do, but maybe explain to me the process. Like how fast are you able to figure that out? Is it the first call? What are you guys doing on, on your end? It's the, it is typically the first call, which is part of the reason <laughs> okay. why I'm doing it myself, yeah. because I've been doing this long enough. I've put over 550 locations into three brands in seven years, six and a half years. I, I just know, or at least I have a good feeling and I go with my gut. Now that's not to say that when someone starts behaving kind of weird and differently down the process a little bit farther down, like that's not to say we, we won't turn people away later. But like typically on the first or second call, I can start to see whether or not that person is going to be the right fit culturally for our brand. Part of the reason why I'm on the front lines doing it is because the only thing that I feel would get in the way of us becoming the biggest power washing company in the world is bringing in the wrong people. That's the only thing that I feel will get in the way of that. And so if I can hand select and also set the proper expectations with the people coming in on the front end then we can have the f- framework laid to grow into a really big company, which is, which is the goal. What's going on, everybody? I hope you're liking the conversation this far. Please take a moment. Give it a five-star review. It really helps spread this out to as many people as possible. All right, let's get back to the episode. That plays actually really well into my next line of questioning on the responsible franchising and how you... It seems like you guys have a very strong philosophy and strategy as a business, but I think you have, just from what I've heard and the way you speak and and what you post, you have a very strong philosophy on responsible franchising. I mean, I've seen you you speak at IFA and I want to talk about that, but hit me with, hit me with kind of what that means to you. So responsible franchising comes from experiences that I've had and that I've either been directly or indirectly involved with, with irresponsible franchising. So at the company I worked for initially, there just wasn't a ton of support for franchisees and it was a private equity, they were in a private equity turn. So they had to sell as many locations as possible to get the the private equity company return on their investment. And it was kind of regardless of whether or not that person was right. And I was the one selling them the franchise. And so I call them a couple weeks later. They're like, I think I'm supposed to train in two weeks. And I haven't been contacted by any, or I'd call them a year later and they'd like laugh at me and hang up and like it ate at my soul. Like it ate at it. I was like, if this is what franchising is, like I'm out, I was ready to leave the industry. Now we were then purchased by, by cat 
cash by a non-private equity company. And they were like, we're going to give you as much money as you need to re repair things and go and find other brands. And I was like, okay, cool. Like that's exciting to me. Then they bought a brand, the, the one that I worked on, the drywall repair brand. And like there were a hundred locations sold, 40 franchisees, no employees. I was the only employee to start. And like the franchisees were suffering. It killed wow. me. And they kill, it killed me. They were like, I was told I could run the business from a different state while I work my job uh -huh. on the New York Stock Exchange. Like, uh -huh. this is nuts. This is not how it should be. So with that situation, they let me kind of operate in a silo and work with a brand president and effectively turn it around in a way where I thought we did a really good job. There were things we could have done better, but like, ultimately we were able to turn things around and, and, and write the ship and become the biggest drywall repair company in the world. Now, I knew that there was a better way. There has to be a better way than like what we're seeing here. And so that's when I started writing about responsible franchising. And to my knowledge, I think, I don't think anyone else was really writing about it or creating content about it before that. And it seems to have sparked a conversation and, you know, almost like a mini movement within the franchise industry because people in your and my generation, like we don't want to hurt people at least. Yeah. Like franchising is a responsibility. Like if I'm going to create a 100%. system for someone to buy it, it is a responsibility. It's not just a business I'm going to try out. Like it's a responsibility. I'm providing you as a franchisee, something that could very positively impact your life or very negatively impact your life. There's not much in yeah. between on it. <laughs> And, and so it's very important to me that rolling suds is yeah. done the right way and that rolling suds then becomes somewhat of an example to future franchisors, franchisees on, Hey, this is actually what responsible franchising and what realistically franchising should be. Anyways, it's not Quiznos, it's not Subway, it's not Burger M or I am or whatever, like those are bad examples of irresponsible franchisors, but there are actually good franchisors. And so there's a whole, I have a whole like theories and philosophies and solutions. I could go into this for hours, but yeah, that's kind of my general experience and why it's so yeah. important. Okay. I love that. And yeah, I think there's a place for that. I, 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 on one hand, I want to create a narrative and, and tell a story with this podcast, but on the other hand, I want to give super high level nitty gritty, yeah. you know, from super macro to super micro information so people can learn and use this as a resource. Right. So I appreciate, I always appreciate and respect the nerd, the nerd out real quick. Like I'll, I might call on you to do that more as we, <laughs> as we move on. It's sure. really cool though, because you, I was going to ask like, and I ask this often, like if you could create a, you know, quote unquote, perfect system from scratch, how would you do it? And not, I'm sure, you know, you guys with rolling suds are, are growing every day and you're experiencing issues and nobody's actually perfect, but you actually did get the opportunity to build out the franchise system of within the business from scratch. So what are some key yep. staples that franchise candidates need to look for when they're investigating franchise brands, right? You can take it two different ways. What do they need to look for? And then what do they need to stay away from? And you can always chart sure. rolling suds and what you guys are doing great if that's, if no, that's I'll, part of how I'll you talk, answer. I'll talk specifically about just in general about a franchise. So a franchise cool. or especially an emerging one, they can't do everything. The amount of capital it takes to create a like a sufficient call center, a franchisor shouldn't spend their money. An emerging franchisor probably shouldn't spend their money and time on that, which means they need to outsource a lot of things. A, an emerging franchisor can't become a marketing company. Typically they can't, you know, there are certain things that they can't do, which means that they need to figure out what solutions am I going to provide for franchisees? Which ones can I do in house, which are the highest leverage things for me to do in house and my team to build. And then what do I need to outsource? And, and, and my thought of franchisors should provide as much layers of services as they possibly can in order to justify their, their royalty. Right. And that's kind of the way I look at it. Like we have to earn our royalty. So we have, before I even launched, we had like 17 or 18 suppliers, relationships, service level agreements in place. I spent months negotiating with suppliers 
developing relationships with them, negotiating it down for franchisees, call center, insurance, payroll, credit card processing, commercial marketing, residential marketing, like a whole litany of services so that the franchisee doesn't have to sit there and try to figure it all out. Like that stuff's already taken care of. They can focus on execution. And then I was like, what am I, what are we best at internally? And it's coaching and training and replicating a 34 year old business that has really good systems. So how do we teach people to replicate that and take as much off the plate of the franchisee as possible? So good supplier relationships is something that probably a lot of potential franchisees aren't asking about. They're just asking about mm -hmm. how does the training work or how does the, how does the marketing work? But well, there are so many pieces to it. And then the team, building the team to support franchisees before you need the team. So if franchisees are, if franchisors are selling a ton of units and there's one corporate owned location and they've got maybe one or two employees that they're sharing and they're launching this franchise system and they sell a hundred locations, but they don't have the team to support it internally and they're not overstaffed. That's something else that they need to look for. Very interesting. Is there, and that, those are really good answers because I see on my side, there are franchisors or the parent companies that they have those things, quote unquote, right. like on paper and they offer those. But I mean, is there a little bit extra that a franchisee can, can see or how do they take that extra step to really validate what's real and what's kind of just in front of them? just so they set yeah. themselves up for success. Franchisees can ask, what are you looking for in a supplier? When you vet okay. a vendor, what is it that you're looking for? What are the things that you're looking for before you sign a service level agreement with a CRM or with a payroll services company? Like, what are you looking for in, in, that, in that vendor? And I think that'd actually be a really good question. And my answer would be, listen, we're adding 100 units a year and we're gonna open a hundred units. Like we'll have over a hundred trucks on the road by the end of this year. And so when I'm vetting suppliers, I'm a, this is our mission statement. And these are our core values. Like, does this align? And like, explain to me how it aligns with your business. Also, we're going to add this many units. Tell me what your service and what your experience for customers. And I look at franchisees as our customers is going to be. And then are you willing to invest in infrastructure for your business to support my franchisees? Because if I had a hundred locations in a year, you probably don't have the staff right now to support that. Are you willing to hire? Are you willing to put people in place? Like, and then I put in the service level agreement, they agree to those things. And I write, I put it in writing. You told me you were going to do it and you didn't do it. So we're switching. Now. It's in the agreement. And so wow. a good franchisor should hold their suppliers accountable yeah. in the same way that they hold their employees accountable. So, I mean, there's a bunch of other questions, but that's one that's off my thought. No, my that's good. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. This is a it's very high level and it's a different train of thought that I don't think a lot of people go in with that they can, they can use this as a, as a value add to their approach. So I appreciate you for... Yep for sharing that. Something that you said in your story is actually really interesting. So you had the opportunity to level up within the organization that you were in and it sounded good. And what you told me, man, that, that sounded like a really good offer, but you yeah. looked in the mirror and you said, no, nah, I can do this by myself. What was it about you in that moment that gave you the juice, that gave you the self-assurance that you actually could do it? well like i don't want to just pass through that that was actually really big yeah no i know exactly 100 percent. so and just to add like weight to it i <laughs> i made over half a million dollars and they're like we'll double your salary so like whoa like it wasn't like hey we're gonna you know it was like i made the more money than i've ever made in my life and they're like we're gonna double it and so i was like a i can do this on my own but B, going back to the responsible franchising side of things, I had seen franchising done the wrong way more than I had seen it done the right way from my vantage point. And we acquired businesses and they were in similar state as the business that I helped turn around. And like franchisees weren't getting what I think franchising should be able to provide. Some. It was more like I paid all this money and like I have to pay a royalty monthly and I'm still figuring it out on my own. And like, 
Yeah. To me, that's not what franchising should be, at least right. not responsible franchising. And so even if I got this killer job offer and had an unlimited budget and like all that stuff, I'd still be operating within the confines of another company and what the other company thinks that we should provide from a franchising perspective. And I wanted to do something that's never been done before, which is like unfettered support for franchisees to be able to hire whomever I want, whenever I want to pay them whatever money they needed in order to do the job well, increase pay, create comp structures that were unique. And the only way I was going to be able to do that and provide that level of support is if I owned the company. Majority ownership could make decisions exactly how I knew needed to be made. And that, based on everything I've seen, was a non-negotiable for me. And so I came to my wife, who, by the way, was seven months pregnant with our daughter at the time. Oh, come on. <laughs> and that's wow. like, and I was like, all right, I know I got this job offer and my life has been pretty like chill in terms of like, you know, <laughs> I've got my systems down, but like, hear me out, hear me out. I want to franchise a business. I don't have the business yet. I'm going to raise capital. I've never done that before, but I'm going to raise it and I don't have it yet, but I'm going to find it. What do you think? And she goes, Aaron, I know you're going to take care of us. You've had a very successful career in franchising. Go go do what you want to do and we'll figure wow. it out. Wow. And I'm the sole provider of income in my house. So, wow. you know, that, that so it, I put like, I'm all in on not only rolling suds, but like we're doing it responsibly and then like building in public so that other franchisors can say, oh, that's how I should do it. Or, hey, I learned this thing from Aaron's content and like I've changed this element. And that's what's happened. I'm getting messages from emerging franchisors and being like, I read this piece of content and I've changed my entire strategy internal. And that's wild. Yo, yo, yo. Thanks for listening this far. It's at this point in the episode that I want to talk about Streetwise Franchising, teaching, training, building, Streetwise Franchising. As a franchise consultant, it's my job, it's my absolute pleasure, and it's my mission to help aspiring entrepreneurs find launch and build their ideal business i've been a franchise owner for almost a decade i know what it means to struggle i know what it means to build a team if you're ready to get off a of zero if you're ready to build something for yourself visit streetwisefranchising.com let's get the conversation started don't wait until tomorrow to build your future it starts today streetwise franchising stay humble stay hungry stay streetwise let's get back to the episode that is, man, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I hope you heard that there. There, there was a lot in that. And that's really cool. I appreciate you for, for sharing that. Okay. So back to it, raising capital, you never did it before. That's something yep. that, you know, you know, you see it. And as I grow and, and kind of adapt and pivot in this entrepreneurial game, there's a raising capital is a, is a huge skill that people yep. are able to leverage. And what was that like? For you, I mean, what were some of the things that you failed in? What are the things that you learned sure. when uh, you, you started down that path? So I did not know anything about raising capital. In fact, okay, I didn't even know what a cap table was. Like, just to give you an idea of like how little I, I didn't know what a class A share was. I didn't know what a class B share was. I didn't know what a class C share was. And I was okay. working with very sophisticated people who have done this many, many times. And it was like they were speaking a language that I didn't understand. And there's not like you can't Google like how do I acquire the franchise rights for a 33 year old pressure washing business? And what is the you know, what's the playbook for that? Like it doesn't exist. So I was you just, can't type that into Chad GPT. Chad no, GPT, Ch can't GPT doesn't oh, have on. the answer for that. No, no, no. <laughs> OK, so it was like I was it was like everyone was speaking like I, it was like I was dropped in the middle of Taiwan and yeah. I had no phone and I was in the middle of a forest and I needed to figure out how to eat and no one spoke English is oh. pretty much what I would explain what I would uh, liken yeah. it to. I also had to come up with valuations of a business that didn't necessarily have one. Yet. Like it was all theoretical. And that's the really interesting thing about raising capital is it's all theoretical it's essentially like i could make anything on a spreadsheet work but like wow 
everyone places their own value. And then there's risks of like, people are like, well, I'm the first money in, so I should have it be at this valuation. And I'm like, well, that's not going to make sense because I need to get to here. In order to get to here, we need this valuation. And so I kind of just basically totally won it. And, <laughs> and I ended up raising a lot of money and I picked the wow. right partners who uh, could provide mentorship. One of the best pieces of advice I received was raise oh. smart money. There is a lot oh, of dumb money down. out there. Yeah. It was one of the best pieces of advice I raised, like got, I got. Cause like a lot of people, when you're in that position, want to give you money. And, and so I raised from people like David Barr and Brad Fishman and Scott Weber and Angelo Leia. These are people who have been multi-brand franchisors or multi-brand franchisees. That's awesome. Could, and I answer when I have a problem and I don't know what to do, I can call anyone on my board that has different levels of expertise and ask them what their opinions are. And I've done that. And a couple of my, my board members, I talked to weekly. And we just were in Aspen at the beginning of this year and did our annual, you know, review or our, I guess it's inaugural because it's the first year. And like, I had never done a board meeting before. And I, you know, so I just wrote up on 25 pages of a document of what I thought we should talk about. And we got through the whole thing. And like, so anyone who's thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, like you will not have it figured out ever. Like a franchise mm -hmm. provides some level of support to help skip a lot of those steps but like it's just you're just figuring it out like as you go along and that's why it's not for the faint of heart because like people Man, need to know exactly what to do and i'm like well i'm gonna do this and i don't know how to do it but we're gonna do it yeah that speaks into the value of somebody looking into a franchise is somebody coming before them and falling on their face and getting it figured out and, and building it so that's actually an, an interesting kind of a segue i'm gonna pivot a little bit so hopefully I don't screw this up, but what's the value in, how am I going to phrase this? There's franchise concepts out there that the big brands, they put together based on their own systems and their verticals, and they build a brand around, around that. And then there's other franchise concepts that like, like your brand, Rolling Suds, that has 33 years of, of, of history, of experience. What's the value differentiator between those two is one, I mean, I'm assuming you might be biased, but I'm asking anyway, is one more valuable than other? And what do people need to be careful of when they do their investigations? So I had the option to do both. So, and I considered both because I have, okay. I have the systems, like I brought all of the, like I brought the marketing suppliers, table, I brought the call center, I brought insurance relationships. I brought all the vendors other than like Got it. two, right? So like I could have taken all of the stuff that I've done from other brands, incubated it from scratch, have no item 19, sell from scratch, just purely on my background, right? So, and we could, we would have figured it out and it would have been fine. Yeah. But there is something to be said about having a subject matter expert in the specific vertical that you're going into that can answer questions that no matter what experience that I've had in franchising, I wouldn't be able to answer a certain question about what chemical to use for a certain type of job or what nozzle to use for that. Now, could I watch YouTube videos and figure it out and create systems around the best YouTube? Again, yes, we could create operations manuals around it. But these, my founders built, have built an over $2 million power washing business and they're one of the largest really? in the country, right? So like, and they've perfected a process that is proprietary that no one else has. They can, we can shoot five stories from the ground. We can do a 3000 square foot house in 25 minutes, start to finish. Wow. And so that becomes very, very valuable for someone who's considering becoming a franchisee. And so when you take the knowledge that I had in franchising and creating a franchise system, and you take our founder's knowledge in power washing and how to build a power washing company that exceeds $2 million or $4 million or whatever, however big the businesses are, and you combine the two, I truly believe, I don't believe there is a better way to incubate a brand. And as you said, I'm biased, but I considered it doing it the other way. And I don't feel like we would have 
we would have grown to the rate that we are now as responsibly as we have without having those founders very involved in the success of franchisees. So I can focus what I'm good at, which is coaching and training and building franchise system, a franchise system. And they can focus on, all right, this is exactly how you build a two plus million dollar power washing business. Okay. That's beautiful. There's a lot of value there. Thank you for that answer. When a franchisee is looking at your brand and maybe they're looking at a couple, a couple other brands, but they're evaluating their market. Is this going to fit in my market? And I know from the power washing space, not all market, mosquito space, just from personal. I mean, I got nine years right. in Mosquito Joe. Like right, the mosquito right, right. business is going to be different if I'm in Miami or if I'm in Idaho. So right. how does how would you how would you advise a franchisee coming in and evaluating their personal market when looking at rolling suds or amongst the other that they might be looking at as well? So something that was really important for me is that this so power washing on the residential side is is seasonal. The commercial side is less seasonal, but residential, there's like a window in the year where it's super busy on power washing. And it was really important for me that this business was in a northern market and had been in a northern market for three plus decades because we're in Pennsylvania, New Jersey area. So to me, that proved to me that within that, it, that the model works in a market that is colder, right? And it works well, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't have franchised it. Um, so now I'm thinking of, okay, well, if it's in a northern market and it's cold and we've got numbers that are based on a 205-day year, if we're in Florida or the Carolinas or Tennessee or Texas or other markets, like we now have more days per year to clean. And theoretically, there is now an assumption that, that the numbers could be better, right? Because if you can work more days out of the year, you can utilize the truck more, which means you could generate more revenue. With that said, like I tell the franchisees, and this is part of the responsible franchise and the franchise development process, like these are simply goalposts. We have a business that's been around for 34 years. I've broken it down on a per truck basis because I can teach how much, how much to utilize the truck and what that truck should be doing hourly and all that kind of stuff. But like these are goalposts. We don't have two, three years of franchisee performance to show you what a potential average ROI would be on your investment. And so if joining a startup doesn't sound exciting to you, call me in two years. I'll have the data you're looking for. And so sure. I'm very clear about that so that they know exactly what the potential risk is and also what the potential upside is. That's big. I think you can, you can tell who really wants to stick or who's going to stick longer if you hold it with an open hand rather than yeah. trying to force it down. A, a lot of development, right. I, I feel like this doesn't go for everybody, but it is very sales heavy role. But if you can hold it with an open hand, the opportunity and, you know, a person can hop out at any given moment. It just adds a little bit more genuineness to the approach. And I, sure. I can see how you guys get people that fit your culture that way because you're not forcing it from what it sounds like. Right. And I think that's big. You, you've hit yeah, on this a I'll, few times. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'll talk more people out of it than, than into it. Because Love if that. I tell you how hard it's going to be, and that we're still figuring it out and that we're going to all figure it out together. And as long as it, as long as what I've done in the past continues, it, it should be a good success. But if I can tell you, Hey, this is going to be hard. We're going to grind together and you still decide to buy the franchise. I, you're just going to have a better experience and I'm going to have a better experience because now we know that we're in it together versus it's going to be easy. You don't have to do anything. Like you can hire a manager. It'll run itself. Like to me, that's, that's awful. That's not how yeah, business works. At least not those initially. Are some, those are some red flags. Yeah. I mean, it took, it took us a years and years before we were able to build Mosquito Joe to the point where, A, I wasn't working in the truck every day. And then right. B, to where I could look towards other things. And we went in, I was full time in that business for the first three years before we yeah. started really scaling that thing out. And I think semi-absentee ownership is possible, but it takes time. You got to be careful sure. when it's pushed from day one. Okay. So I'm interested in, I'm interested in you, man, just your story. 
and uh, your background has been really cool at this up to this point. And you've mentioned mentors and advisors and having board of advisors. What has what role has mentorship played into your life on a personal level? I mean, has that helped you in any way level up? It's helped me tremendously. So I feel like the most successful people, they have someone ahead of them that has done what they've done and can advise them. They've got someone with them at the same time or multiple people with them doing the same thing at the same time. And then there's someone that they're giving back to. Well, and so yeah. those Come on. three things, right, help you. You're teaching the things you know, you're figuring things out, and you're learning things all at the same time. And so I have that. I have that with a, a mastermind of, of, of colleagues and other franchisors that, that we meet monthly for 90 minutes and I choose a topic and we talk about it. And there's like eight of us. I have five people on my board who are better at me than all of the things that they are good at, right? Like one's in PR, one's in legal, one's in, you know, so there's all these things. And so I believe that having those things, and then I, you see with the content I give out, like I'm just telling everyone how it's working for me and sharing the yeah. ups and downs. And, and then I go to these conferences and I speak at the conferences about my experiences. And so I'm, I'm giving back. So you have all, you know, I, I kind of like to say the channels open, right. And, and that has tremendously expedited my growth. And now franchisees get that inherently, like that's what they're paying. Like they, they buy into that. Yes, they're getting help with marketing. They're getting help with training, but they have a business coach. They have a bunch of franchisees who are doing the same thing. And then they have new franchisees come in that they can mentor. And that's all built into the franchise system. And so it's allowed me to kind of turn years into months and months into days and days into hours, which makes a big difference when you're scaling a business because time is everything. That's a That's beautiful. How has... Your pain point, things that you've maybe failed at or have you've been thrown into the fire, how has that kind of helped you adapt and mold your purpose in what you're trying to achieve now? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the experiences that I've had prior to, prior to rolling suds have 100% shaped where I'm at now. So like I talk about these experiences with other companies, they weren't bad in the sense that like it like it was good in the sense because it allowed me to to now be where I'm at and have the view and the viewpoints and also be so passionate of where I'm at mm. now so they had to happen unfortunately that way in order to get me here I wouldn't be as passionate as I and I wouldn't know as much as I do now if I didn't have those experiences now the other thing is like w with launching a franchisor there are so many things that can go wrong. Like yeah. doing what I've been. doing what we've do, done in a year to grow to over 100 locations in 11 months and also have all of them be open by, by April. Every single one of them will be open. Like that's essentially like open heart surgery in the amount of things to go right to work. Like there, I have a whole team of 17 people all that have to march in the same direction and talk to each other regularly. I have a whole team of suppliers that have to be marching in the same direction and all the franchisees that come in have to have the right expectations and all be marching in the same direction for us to get to three, four, five, six, seven hundred, a thousand units to become the biggest power washing company in the world. And so the experiences that I've had and the mistakes that I've seen made or the mistakes that I've made on my own are allowing us to now get to that and kind of perform that theoretical open heart surgery in a way that's actually a, a, a ethical and b effective you know because franchisors have a responsibility to deliver for their franchisees no doubt no doubt so when you when you give these keynotes at you know you speak out in public what do you like ifa for example how did that go man i saw you post about it <laughs> What, what, tell me about the process. I mean, that that's like, for me personally, a trajectory that I want to build myself into somebody that is educating, is speaking into people on that scale. So tell me about your process of getting there. And I know we know your backstory and that was a huge yeah. part in it, but specifically speaking at IFA, man, that just seems really cool to me. 
tell me about it. Tell me about your process and developing, you know, the actual keynote itself. And yeah. So last year in February, March, I sat down with the CEO of the IFA at a conference okay. called the Unconference, which you should yeah. totally attend regardless of whether okay. or not you ski or snowboard. It's happening in two weeks. And I um, do ski. Okay. So it's literally 150 people in franchising, basically. There's about an hour to an hour and a half of content in the morning, and then everyone goes and skis and snowboards the rest of the day. Oh, come it's on. like the best conference. It's amazing. And my one of my board members puts the conference on. And so I sat down with the CEO of the IFA, and I was like, here are my concerns with what's going on in the industry based on what I've seen, what I've either participated in, and where I see us going in the next 20 years if things don't change. And he goes, Aaron, we have been talking about this for years. And I won't get into all of it because I don't know that it's necessary, but like there are things in the franchise space that I believe from a culture perspective need to change and needs to be more focused on the franchisees versus the franchisors making money. I look at this more of an abundance mindset. If franchisees are successful and they're making money, then we've now delivered on our promise as a franchisor. And now we're going to have more royalties and our business is going to grow a lot more because we've got franchisees that want to reinvest and continue to grow the business. Whereas I don't feel like that culture has been there for decades past. And so I expressed to him my concerns as I'm now becoming a franchisor and I'm launching my franchise system. If this behavior and these things continue, how it could negatively impact my business and also just the industry as a whole. So we sat down and talked about that. So anyways, about three, four months before the IFA conference, he messaged me and he goes, I want you to open up a session, maybe tell your story for like five, 10 minutes and it'll be in the afternoon and it'll be great. And I was like, cool, easy peasy. Then three weeks before the conference, he goes, Aaron, you're actually now going to be the keynote of the event. You're going <laughs> to open up the general session and you're going to speak for 30 minutes. And I'm like, wow. that is a very different ask. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it. I had never given a keynote before. I was like, okay, I have three weeks now and I'm, keep in mind, running a hundred unit franchise system or whatever as well. So I'm busy all day long. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm, you know, going to go write a speech and I've never done this and I've never spoken to someone because that's a long time to keep people's attention. I mean, 30 minutes no is like, you can't be boring. So I wrote the speech. Then I rewrote the speech. Then I practiced the speech, then I recorded it, then I rewrote it, and I basically just did that. And then I made a PowerPoint, and then I put bullet points behind the PowerPoint. And like, I can't, I can't remember an entire speech. So my process is I just have to write it over and over again. And then I have sure. a general trajectory of what I'm going to talk about. And sure. they take a long time to prepare for. Um, and the second time I did it, I at least had... A process like I did another one a couple weeks, three weeks ago, and I had a okay. process that I went through, so it was faster. But like, yeah, and then I got up there, and I came up with four core tenets of what I believe responsible franchising is, which is setting clear expectations with the franchisee as to how hard it's going to be, providing like making sure that the franchisor has the right amount of capital. So capital adequacy is the second tenant that I propose. So franchisor capital, franchisee capital, choosing the right franchisees, which I've talked about and making sure that the right franchisees come in and fit with the ethos of the brand. And then we're not just selling to anyone who wants to get right a check and then sustainable growth. So not, not selling more franchises that you then you can feasibly support. And so I, I proposed those and then I basically broke down, like, here's how much legal is potentially going to cost. Here's how much marketing is going to cost. Here's how much getting set up and, you know, building a sales department or doing externally is going to cost. And, and I did all that. And there was, was a room of 300 plus franchisors, emerging franchisors. And I said, and I, so I broke, I broke it down and, and. Uh, and then I said, you need to know exactly how much it's going to cost you in infrastructure to get a franchisee open and profitable. And like, you need to have that amount of money in a bank account times however the amount of units are that you want to sell. And you need to have that in a, in a war chest account of money that you don't touch. 
plus all those other costs. And I had Jaws hit the ground during <laughs> like, like, like hit the ground. Like, oh my God, I need that much money. And it's like, yes, because being a franchise wow. is a responsibility. And so I basically yeah. ended the, the event with like, listen, I'm part of this next generation of franchisors. I plan to do everything in my power to franchise responsibly. I'm going to make mistakes, but I want you to do, I want you guys to enter this next generation with me. And it was awesome. The response was killer. Like they had an ask me anything panel afterwards with IFA board members. And they were like, I agree with everything that Aaron just said. Like, and and I'll tell you this because it's it's actually kind of evolved since then. Matt Haller, the CEO of the IFA, asked for the transcript of my spe speech. He's like, "Can I quote you in this?" Because the pro the response went so well, and he's like, "So I sent it to him." He then put an article out that he wrote that he quoted me in, and was like, "These are the core tenets of responsible franchising. This is what we're doing." Love it. It was awesome. So then, take it a few steps further. At the IFA conference, the big one, the 4,000 person event that happened a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, state of the franchise industry, responsible franchising. Here are the tenants. Here's what we believe it is. Here's what we're doing now to 4,000 people. Then this, the editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine reaches out to me, the editor in chief, so like the guy who like runs the magazine and, and is like, Aaron, we're doing a piece. We want to do a piece on responsible franchising. We see this as either somewhere between a conversation and a movement within franchising. And we'd like to pair you up with the professional writer to tell your story and write a 2000 word magazine piece yeah. on responsible franchising. So we're doing that. That's awesome. And that's just this validation right there for you, know, you and what you're building and your experience. I was going to ask you, when, when's the book coming out? When can I order it on Amazon, man? <laughs> we'll I, start with I'm the 2000 word bit. piece in Entrepreneur and we'll, I mean, we'll go from there, but like, we're just getting started. That's what's so exciting. I mean, we're literally just getting started. Love it. Love it. Okay. So as we're, as we turn into the fourth quarter here, you know, I interact with a ton of people that are currently franchisees. I have people that are looking to become franchisees. And I have people that, you know, similar to myself, started with, you know, some a side hustle that grew and is now yep. supporting them. And they're looking to level up. And a lot of these guys, they might be interested in purchasing a franchise and investing in a franchise and adding that to their portfolio. Some of these guys are actually interested in turning their business into a franchise. And they come to me because of my experience in the space. What are some base things that you advise would advise somebody on that is considering turning their hustle or their business into a franchise having straight from somebody like yourself yeah so i i talk to folks like that all the time so i would i would i would think about a few things before deciding to franchise your business one why why do you want to do it like literally what mm. is the why because it's going to be very hard the other thing is like if someone has, let's just say a good epoxy coatings business that does a million dollars a year and brings home 200K in net earnings, if they love that business, they're going to have to have a why that's large enough to become a franchisor because it's going to take them away from that business that they love Ooh. and they're good at. Yeah. Like they can't do both. Like you can't be in both places at once. So they're going to have to build a team, put a team in place step into the franchise role, which is a business they know nothing about, and they're yep. going to have to figure it out. And not only is it going to be really hard because they don't know what to do, really, they're going to burn a ton of cash because mm -hmm. especially if they hire like an outsider sales organization to sell franchises, they're not going to have any money left from the franchise fees, really, because that goes and gets paid out elsewhere. So they have to have even more money. So basically, like they're going to go from like, I'm really good at this thing and I'm excellent at it. To I'm really bad at this thing. I'm going to lose a lot of money and it might work out. And so like I said this, I posted a, a piece of content about this recently. Like most people shouldn't franchise their business. Most should not. Every year we have 300 people file an FDD for the first time. And in the same time, every single year, 300 people decide not to file an FDD the following year. Mm. 
So there's wow. constant churn. You know, you yeah. wonder why the franchise industry has bad reputation. It's it's that. It's that churn. They don't they don't know what they're doing. And so I think anyone who's considering franchising their business, they need to understand that this is a completely different business. It's not like I have a good epoxy coatings business. I'm just going to sell it to someone else. I'm going to collect a franchise fee and they're going to pay me a royalty forever. It's not that. It's infrastructure. It's capital. It's coaching. You're a mentor. You're a therapist. Sometimes like you're at any given moment, you're something different than what you're used to be. So if you don't truly understand why you're doing it and have the passion necessary to go out there and put yourself on the line and learn something new, you're going to struggle. So I always tell them that. Oftentimes when they know they need 500, a million, million and a half, 2 million in the bank to do it, they're like, oh, Whoa. yeah, I thought I was just going to buy an FTD for 25 grand and sell franchises. Like, yeah. Oh, you're going to burn cash for a while and it might not go well and your franchisees might not be successful and you will have franchisees fail and you might get sued. Like it, that's like. That's, that's the reality. That's the reality. That's why it's yeah. a responsibility. And so I, I talk more people out of franchising their business than I do franchising their business because of everything I just talked about. Now, with that said, that's the downside. The upside is you get to change a ton of lives if you do it right. You get to watch people's whole world change. You get to be part of that. You get to see their families grow up in this world that you helped them create together, your partners with these. So it's like the most rewarding thing professionally that I've ever done. And that, and I will only do this for the rest of my life. I will only franchise businesses and scale franchise systems for the rest of my life because I love it. But it's hard. And so, yeah. you know, there. I, if someone decides I want to franchise my business, I would recommend getting mentors that have done it before, just as I did recommend raising sure. a significant amount of capital, whatever amount of capital that you think you need, double or triple it, and then put okay. that in the bank. And hire someone who has helped franchisees be successful before and has experience in franchising. Get ready to pay that person between one hundred dollars to $150,000 a year. Wow. And, and, and go. But make sure yeah. you have the right pieces in place to do it. And that you're okay oh, good stepping stuff. away from the thing you love. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. That was awesome. Man, such a value add. So, okay, before before I run out of time, you you had posted something a while back that really lit a fire under under me personally. And I take a lot of pride in my level of fitness and, uh, you know, the hours that I they spend <laughs> and, you know, that I hit those streets. Your 5K time was impressive. Thank my you. My guy. The question revolves around clarity breaks and what do you do to fill your cup and that sort of a thing. But man, I saw that you got me beat by a couple minutes. So that was uh, that 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 shocked me. So tell me about that, man. It made a fitness journey. You know, what are you doing yeah. to fill your cup is, is really the base <laughs> of the question. But I, I did want to give you a shout out because I was I was very surprised. I appreciate it. Yeah, that was the fastest yeah. I've ever gone on that one that you. You're like, you got a new follower on Strava now. I'm, I'm yeah, like, I was like, I'm, you got the new follower. <laughs> so I do, I race triathlons. So I there do, yeah. So I do the, the shorter ones. I don't, I'm not like an Iron Man or half Iron Man, but like I'll do, sure. I get, I get a lot of, you know, uh, I feel a lot of like competitive elements of what I'm doing from, from that. And it's, it's really enjoyable for me. It helps me in other aspects. So any year on a given year, I'll do between three and seven races. Um, okay. Love it. And so I've been part of a team for the last couple of years. I've had a coach and really kind of like enjoy pushing myself to a level that like isn't natural per se, because really in a lot of elder elements of my life, I'm doing the same thing. I mean, we're doing something at Rolling Stones that no one's ever done before, you know, like, and, and that that's pushing myself to this next level. I'm, you know, I'm married. I have two young children. Like I have, you know, son who's almost three and my daughter's 15 months. That's also really hard. So like I try to oh, fit all beautiful. of this in. I mean, I love it. All yeah. of it I love, but like yeah, pushing myself on that level really helps me in other aspects of my life. 
Love that. I'm a big advocate for that sort of a thing. I do a lot of Spartan races. I do high rocks. I, I nice. haven't done a triathlon yet because I am a terrible swimmer. Yeah. Like really, really bad. And I gotta, I gotta overcome that. That's one of the, that's the next stage for me. But no, it's that really is cool. The hardest right? thing is the swimming part for sure. Yeah, like for sure, okay. for sure, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I gotta, I gotta level up there. But you know, I'm a big advocate and believer. And I asked you this before, but about what pain has helped lead to your purpose. And I think the self-induced pain that we can get through physical activity can help us channel that mindset that we can then use in other areas of our life. So just from like a base personal development kind of a statement, I love, I think that's really important. Okay, man, next up, before I finish, I got to ask you, as you, as you achieve your personal legacy, as you, you know, are looking to make these big moves, are you, are you thinking about like what's next for you in this space? Does your mind do you even allow yourself to think or are you so ingrained in what you're building currently that it takes up all your time? No, I mean, I have a 10 year plan. Like, yeah. and I think anyone who starts a business should do that. We run our business on EOS. So nice. we have quarterly Lovely. planning meetings. We have weekly level 10 meetings. Uh, and for in, any of those who don't know, that's entrepreneurial operating system, uh, Gino Wickman. Yeah. So I self implemented at the beginning, um, that 10 year plan has changed because we're hitting year three goals on month 11. Um, yeah, love it. So, wow. so, so, which is all good stuff. So my plan will be to add other brands. I'm going to do it in a measured way. So instead of like two to four a year, which I've seen with some different companies, I'll do like two, like one to two every three years ish, two to three years. Okay. Get the, the units to 200 open and operating franchisees and then put teams in place and kind of grow and scale. So, so currently the, the, the first thing I need to do now is get someone in the position that I'm doing currently, which is talking to franchisees on a daily basis and get more to go. You know, I made the commitment to hand select the first hundred locations myself. Got um, it. To get someone to, to take this off because that's 50 hours of my my week that I'm I'm talking to potential candidates, which is a lot. And yeah, then yeah. that'll free me up to do more CEO stuff. And then also in the future, in the next couple of years, potentially launch another brand. But to build responsibly build franchise brands for the next for the next 35 plus years. I love that. I love that. Well, you 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 have a stage here on the Streetwise podcast to thank you. You're you're welcome to always come back and and talk about what you're building, man. And I think you got yourself a a Strava follower in me. You have a a synergy partner when it comes to the energy that you're bringing to the industry. I love it, man. I love what you're doing. I'm so glad we got to connect. And again, me too. This is this is big. This is big for me. I just I want to give you some roses, man. I, I, when I first really shifted gears on what my mindset was going to be in moving forward. And when I started self-implementing EOS, it was around that time that I started, you know, seeking individuals that were doing it at a high level and uh, your name, you know, you came up and uh, you were interacting with a lot of the people that I were following. And so uh, it's really cool to, to share this platform with you, man. Uh, last question, I'll let you go. I promise. If you're talking to somebody who is looking to get off of zero and they're maybe they don't know where to start or they're a little afraid. What do you say to that person to help give them what they need to take that step? Literally just take the step, like just, just do it. Like you'll never, it, the timing will never be right. I launched a franchise system, had our second child at the same exact time with an offer of <laughs> half a million plus to continue doing the stuff that I've been doing. Like, it was not a good time, but like no time is a, no time yeah. is a good time to start a business. So if you're waiting for that perfect time, you will be waiting forever. And the opportunity cost of continuing to wait and the time that you'll lose by waiting for the perfect time, the opportunity cost is higher than just is, is worth just making the decision and just doing it. Oh, man. That was awesome. Thank you so much, man. If you guys were excited about this episode, man, like it, share it, 
Follow Aaron on LinkedIn. If you're a franchisor or in the industry, man, you better already be following this guy because there's a <laughs> lot of value add with what he's Thank putting you. out every single day, folks. Like, come on now. As always, I ended every episode the same. Stay humble, stay hungry, stay streetwise. Peace. All right, everybody, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for making it to the end. Hey, if this episode added any value to your life at all, please like it, share it, give me a five-star review. It's the only way that this show is going to gain traction and help more people achieve their dreams. If you're ready to start your franchise journey, visit streetwisefranchising.com. Let's set up a time to talk. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Until next time, stay humble, stay hungry, stay streetwise. Peace.